The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And this is one of the most famous, most well-known verses in all the Bible. Not just through the Old Testament, but from beginning to end. It's up there with John 3.16. And if you are someone who knows any Bible whatsoever, you probably have seen John 3.16 held up on a poster at a football game. But some way, somehow, you know that the Lord is my shepherd and that I shall not want. Whether you are a churchgoer or not, whether you are religious or not, whether you would ever darken the door of a church or not, some way, somehow, just about everybody out there knows that the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. Well, why is that? Of all the verses that you could take from the Old Testament, of all the verses you could take from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, John 3.16 about the salvation plan of Christ and hey, holding up this poster in a football game. That's one thing. But why this one? You know, it's it's just this psalm kind of in the middle of the psalms. It's you know, there's 149 other psalms. Why does this one stick out? Frankly, of all the places in the Old Testament, why would people have paid so much attention to this kind of uh, the worship music of ancient Israel? The the praise poetry of the Jews. Why? Because so many people have heard this and have heard it again and again and again and again. Like I said, churchgoer or not, religious or not, dark in the door of a church or not, people have heard this so many times. Why? Where do they hear it? Not rhetorical. Where do they hear it? At the funerals. Thank you. We hear this at funerals. Now, you can hear that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, within a funeral at a church across every denomination. You can hear that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, at a funeral at a Jewish synagogue. You can hear that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, at some random funeral home where the only funeral music they play is Frank Sinatra's My Way. <laughs> And that's because this verse, it almost seems to call to us, no matter who we are, no matter where we are, no matter when the occasion of death strikes us, our family, our friends, our neighbors, our loved ones, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The words of the 23rd Psalm, they resonate deep within our hearts for some reason. And again, it's like everybody knows this. As a matter of fact, though the 23rd Psalm is our appointed psalm, I didn't even bother taking the version out of the prayer book. It's a perfectly fine version, but nobody knows it. Everybody knows the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. As a matter of fact, if you don't say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, then people will look at you funny like, No, no, there's a yay in there. <laughs> this is a verse that we basically all know, and frankly, even a version that we all know, and it crosses every line that you could expect or imagine. Because, like I said, it calls to us, no matter who or when we are, because... Each of us, within this mortal life, touched by grief. Each of us, in this mortal life, known someone who has died. Each of us, in this mortal life, face that as not just a possibility, but a certainty for ourselves as well. And this verse, just a random song. There in the middle of the Old Testament, it speaks to us, it calls to us, because the truth of this word, of all the things that God can be described as, of all the things that Scripture uses to describe Him, strong rock, 
bright and morning star. He's a king. He's a lord of all of the things. He is also our shepherd. And there is an essential truth about this. Whether you are church going or religious or anything at all, we have been built to resonate with this because we understand that some way, somehow, that the God who made all that there is seen and unseen, the one thing that we simply cannot do, which is make something from nothing. So whoever did that, to have some sort of sense that he cares for us, that he knows us, that he would actually lead us. It makes all the difference when we face the end of our mortal lives and the end of those who we know and love. So, if we would go to this next slide, we don't have prayer books in front of us. This is directly out of the prayer book. It's page 491. And if you have been to a funeral here, that's what we use for our services. Uh, you know, burial, memorial, funeral, and all that kind of stuff. It's basically different names for the same thing. And if you note, starting at the beginning of this particular liturgy on page 491, you see that in the prayer book that this is the celebration of life. Right? No? That's not what it says up there at the top. The liturgy of the resurrection. Does it say that? What does it say? The burial of the dead. The burial of the dead. And that sounds kind of hard. And it kind of hits us like a ton of bricks. We almost don't want to call it that, right? And yet, the prayer book acknowledges what we are doing within this particular service. Yes, we may indeed celebrate a life, and most certainly we will remember the resurrection, but ultimately the reason we are gathered at that time, at that place, with these people, is to bury our dead. And if it hits us like a ton of bricks, it should. It should hit us like a ton of bricks, because death hits us like a ton of bricks. It is the common fate to every single one of us, and yet, our hearts and our spirits rage against it. We don't want it to happen. We don't want it to happen to us. We don't want it to happen to our loved ones. We don't want it to happen to our friends. And it hits us like a ton of bricks because it is, in this life, a brick wall. And those on the other side of the wall are separated and sundered from us, and we will never, we will never, we will never see them again. Not in this mortal life. We might want to talk to them, we can't. We might want to hold them, but we can't. We might want to say one more word, have one more embrace, and we can't because in this mortal life, we remain alive and they have died. And it hits us like a ton of bricks because it hurts and because it's hard and because it feels rock solid and immovable, which in this mortal life it is. But... Though it hits us like a ton of bricks, where we simply acknowledge what we're doing is burying our dead. That's not all that we do. Now, this particular service, the star of the show, if you've, if you've never understood this, the star of the show is not the deceased. Did you realize that? The star of the show is Jesus and his resurrection. For that is why when we bury our dead, we do not do so without hope. We do not do so with grief unbearable that leads to despair. This is why when we bury our dead, we do so with sadness that's mingled with joy, with hope, with expectation, because even our dead have a good shepherd who knows the way home. A Lord who knows them, who made them, who loved them, and leads them faithfully and true. Can lead us through this life, through its toils and through its dangers, through its paths up and down and rocky and curved. Can protect us from the danger, from the wolves and from the lions out in this world. And can lead us to a place of refreshment and nourishment, to the green grass, to the still waters 
where we can be nourished not just with our bodies, but with our souls. And when our mortal life concludes, he knows the way to lead us safely home. Safely to his father's house where we might be with our good shepherd forever. It is that resurrection then that is the star of the show that doesn't make the deceased immaterial or incidental. The reason we gather and can be grateful for the resurrection is because of the life of this person whom we know and love. This is a real person. This is a unique person gathered and mourned by real and unique people with real and unique memories, relationships, and love. And this is the lens through which we see the resurrection at that time and in this place. But that's why we're not just celebrating life and we're not just remembering the resurrection because if that's all we did, you know, we're going we're gonna to share funny stories or, or offer poignant memories. If that's all that we have, it would lead us to deeper grief and to a bottomless pit of despair. Think about it, that this is it. This is all we have. And, and this funny thing happened, and I remember when they did that, but now it's gone. Now it's done. I will never have a moment like that again. I will never see them again. Even that which was once sweet and joyful now just feels like a reminder of pain. The poignant memories now just point us to loss. If death is simply a darkness, the cessation of being, emptiness, the grave as a whole. We bury our dead and when we tell those stories, they lead us to despair. But if the resurrection is the star of the show, even our grief <coughs> is mixed with joy. Even our sadness is mixed with hope. And as we remember this one person, as we remember these lives which were bound together, as we share those particular funny stories or those particular poignant memories, they point us through our grief and through our loss and by the resurrection of Christ, points us on to Him with the knowledge and assurance that a good shepherd will lead all of those who trust in Him safely home forever. It's good for those who have died. It's good for those of us who still live. Because He is our shepherd and He is good. Now, this might seem kind of strange. Why in the world is Father Dave talking about funerals here in the middle of the Easter season? Well, flipping just a couple of pages further within that liturgy, you'll see a section of the different readings that can happen within that service. Now, when I, sit, I plan a funeral service with a family, we look at that section in the prayer book, and, and we talk about, well, you know, you can pick kind of different compliments. It can look like a Sunday morning with Old Testament psalm and epistle and gospel, or you can pick a completely different configuration. Maybe, um, you know, the family's favorite verse or a passage that seems particularly meaningful based on the circumstances. What the prayer book does is offer particularly appropriate suggestions, meaning over the centuries, these particular passages highlighted have found themselves to be trustworthy and true at a time like that. You don't have to pick them, but sometimes you go to a family in grief and you're like, uh, what Bible verse would you want? Uh, I don't even know. I don't even know where to start. The prayer book says, start here. Start here. So, looking at that first section from the New Testament, do you notice anything that seems particularly timely? How about Revelation 7? Because we just read it. Okay. Well, let's look at the Gospel. Now, interestingly enough, they're all from the Gospel of John, but anything else that you notice in here that seems particularly timely? John chapter 10. Because we just read that too. Connecting those as a suitable psalm, what 
is the very first psalm they suggest as being particularly appropriate? The 23rd. We're given, in essence, funeral readings today. And if that seems strange, or if that seems odd, then let me remind you of something else that I always try to say at the beginning of funeral services here. If you flip through this burial rite until it's all the way done, and then you get in the back section, there's a place for notes. And this is sort of just an explanation about the service. I try to make a practice that every time we have a funeral here, I read from these notes as it tries to explain the purpose of the liturgy itself. So let's look at this for just a moment. It says that the liturgy for the dead is an Easter liturgy. It finds all its meaning in the resurrection. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we too shall be raised. So here within the Easter season, this is not inappropriate at all. That's what we do when we gather for a funeral, no matter what time of the year it is, in that moment, in that service, in our church, and hopefully in our hearts, it's Easter morning. That our grief is mingled with hope, and our sadness mingled with joy. Because Jesus is the first fruits of the new life, of the new creation, through his resurrection, this is not the end. This service is not the end. Their life is not the end. Their grave is not the end. It is Easter morning, and the stone has been rolled away. The liturgy, it continues, therefore, is characterized by joy. Yay! Somebody died! No. No. I didn't say happiness. I said joy. Joy, that theological state of being of assurance. That even when our circumstances might be terrible, but also when they are happy, there is a peaceable spirit, a contentment, a trust in Christ our Lord who transcends our circumstances because they're continually up and down. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. As our todays are sometimes very hard and sometimes very good, He is the same trustworthy and true shepherd who will faithfully lead us. That is characterized then, not by everybody smiling and being happy because, oh, I'm a Christian and somebody died and I'm supposed to be really happy that they're dead because I trust in Jesus so much. Yeah, yeah. That's not it at all. That's not it at all. Why are, could we be joyful? It explains. It's the certainty that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in our creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We can have joy in this service in reference to Romans 8 because of who Jesus is, because of what he has done, and how it is good, not just for us, but for the one who has died. This joy, however, does not make human grief unchristian. The very love we have for each other in Christ brings deep sorrow when we are parted by death. Jesus himself wept at the grave of his friend. So it's okay to cry. It's okay to be sad. It is okay to feel grief. Jesus himself cried. Remember that, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Why does he weep? His friend Lazarus. He's at the tomb of his friend Lazarus who has died. And how does Jesus respond? I mean, Jesus is about to raise this guy from the dead. Jesus knows what's up. But faced in that moment with the real loss of life, with the real tragedy of humanity, with the real knowledge that there is suffering, there is pain, there is tragedy, there is death, Jesus weeps. And without shame, we might too. Good enough for him, good enough for us. So while we rejoice that one we love has entered into the near presence of our Lord, we sorrow in sympathy with those who mourn. That's what makes it an Easter liturgy, no matter when in the year that happens. And that's what makes this not just funeral readings today, but the readings appropriate for this time and this place. And as we celebrate the Easter season, a great 50 
50 days where we might marvel, where we might praise of the resurrection, that it hits home here and now, that life is still hard, that life is still frightening, that suffering still occurs. People get weak, people get sick, and people die, even people that we love, even people that we would desperately want to hold one more time. <coughs> And if it hits us like a ton of bricks, it ought to, because that's how heavy and that's how hard real life is, but it isn't the end. <clears throat> For Easter morning has come. The stone has been rolled away. Christ himself has conquered death and the grave. And those who are willing to follow, those who are able to trust, those who hear him call them by name and respond. They will find in him a shepherd who can lead them through the pitfalls of this life, the hard times and the good, the easy times and the sad, the times that fill our hearts with so much joy we think they're going to burst, and the times where the sadness is so heavy, we feel like we are going to be crushed deep into the dirt. That we have a shepherd who can and will lead us. Not from afar, not from on high. If he is the man upstairs and all of the sheep are downstairs, he's a very poor shepherd indeed. Shepherds have to be right there with the sheep. Shepherds have to see them. Shepherds have to know them. Shepherds even smell like them. But if he's going to defend them from the wolves, he's got to see them. If he's going to lead them to the green grass and the still waters, he's got to show them the way. And because he himself knows the way to go safely home, he can and will do so for us, for our beloved departed, for all those from every tribe, and nation and language and tongue who will call upon the name of Christ. He will lead us through this life and safely back home with him. He will do so faithfully and well forever. For Christ our Lord isn't just any shepherd. He is a good one. He is the very, very best.